Greetings and welcome. In this video, we're going to introduce the idea of a for loop. We're going to show you how to make a for loop and discuss all the situations when you might want to use a for loop instead of a while loop. We're still talking about iterative control, so nothing has really changed, but now we're talking about as we deal with problems that require a loop, we now have a toolbox and we can say this problem is better suited for a for loop or maybe this problem is better suited for a while loop. And we're gonna show you how to break apart those problems so that you don't get bogged down by the details. To get started, let's remind ourselves of the four basic components of a loop. Remember, we use the uh, mnemonic item to specify those parts. I stood for initializing your variables. We talked about the loop control variable. This is the variable here, I in this case, that determines if your loop is going to uh, continue or if it's done. In the test phase, we're checking that loop control variable. In here, we're checking to see if it's less than 10. If it's true, uh, we are going to do what's in the loop. Otherwise, we are done with it. In execute, this is where we add the code that we want the loop to do over and over. And in the modify phase, this is where we adjust the value of the loop control variable. So here, we're adding 1 to i. And when we go back to line 4, we're looking at the new value of i and saying, is that value less than 10, and deciding if we need to keep looping. I happen to have that this that exact loop over here. Uh, we can press play. It's a pretty standard loop that you've built a bunch of times now. The important thing to remember is that this number here basically specifies how many times that inner code gets run. So counting loops such as this one are common. In fact, they're so common that Python decided that they're going to make a loop just for it uh, to shorten it and make it easier to make counting loops. For loops are going to be very useful in situations where we know ahead of time how many times our loop needs to execute. So here's a standard while loop. This is exactly what I had in code. Now I'm going to show you how to turn this into a for loop. So we're going to delete all this and let's just build the for loop. To build a for loop, you type for, and then now you type the name of your loop control variable. So I'm going to say i, and then I'm going to use the words in range, and in the parentheses I'm going to put the starting value of i and the ending value, so 0 and 10. And then I'm going to put a colon, and then I'm going to print i here. So this loop will create a variable called i. It will, basically this creates a list of numbers from 0 to 1 minus this, so 0 to 9, and the first time you go through the loop, i is equal to the first value in that list. The second time you go through the loop, it's equal to the second value, and so on and so forth. So if I press play, it behaves exactly the same as our counted loop, and you can actually see when I go through, um, I when you start is 0, so we print 0. The next time we go through, i is 1. We print 1, i is 2, and we keep doing that until i is 1 less than this second number. And then when that happens, the loop terminates. All the parts of a uh, for loop correspond to items still. Uh, you still have your loop control variable. It just happens to be declared here rather than on its own line. You still initialize the loop control variable's value. And you still have a test, right? It just happens to be that it's all done in one line. So the for loop makes your life a lot easier once you understand what it's doing, but there's a lot of complexities in that one line, so you need to pay attention. For loops also let you iterate through a collection of values. Uh, again, that's not something you need to necessarily know for this lesson, but when we talk about lists and other data structures, you'll understand why the for loop is so powerful and why you want to use it as much as you can. There are several ways that you can write that for loop, that first line. Uh, I just showed you the standard way, right? So Whatever number I put here basically specifies how many times this code in here is going to run. So if I put uh, 100, it will run 100 times going from 0 to 99. Okay. If I want to be lazy, I don't have to specify that first number. So for example, if I just do this, Python will assume that I'm starting at 0, so nothing really changes. But if I want to be super specific, I can specify three numbers in range. Here is the starting number. This is the ending number, and this is how much you want i to change by at the end of each iteration. So for example, if I do from 0, whoops, if I do from 0 to 100, going by 2s, this is basically printing out all the even numbers between 0 and 100, not including 100. All right? And I can even go in reverse. So for example, I can do 100, 0, negative 2. I will start at 100, I will go to 0, and I will subtract 2 from i each time. So now, all the even numbers going down. So that's what that example is showing you there. 
Now that we know how to use a for loop, let's go ahead and work on a problem that requires us to use a loop of some sort. All right, so we're going to write a program that first asks the user how many grades to input, and then we're going to get that many grades from the user. We're going to output how many grades are between 80 and 90, not including 80 and 90, and then we're going to output the max value in the average. A lot of you are going to be tempted to want to write this program all at once, but I'm telling you now that it's very easy to get bogged down in details. So I'm going to present to you a generalized process for approaching these problems that makes each chunk very manageable. The first thing we're going to do is focus on um, constructing our loop. We're going to figure out how many times the loop needs to run. So usually in these types of problems, uh, yes, the user is going to tell you how many grades they want to input. That's also a flag that you can use a for loop, because in a for loop, you can use it so long as you know how many times in advance the loop is going to run. So I can go ahead and I can get the number of grades from the user, and then I can loop uh, that many times, right? Because each time we loop, we'll get a new grade. So I'll make my variable, I'll call it numGrades, and it'll be equal to in input because there's no such thing as I'm going to enter 2.3 grades. And then we're going to construct our loop. Now technically you can use a while loop as well, but I'm going to do a for loop for this lesson, uh, also because they're easier. So I'll say for i in range, and then here, how many times do I want the loop to run? numGrades times. And then I can test it. I can just put a baby print statement here, and I can make sure that if I type 5, that loop something happens in there at least five times. So we're good. So now we have our loop. We know that our loop will loop the correct number of times. Now we can get the user input. So we can go here and we can say that um, I need to get a grade. So let's get a grade. Get each grade from the user. And I, what I will do is I make a variable called grade and I'll make it equal to float input because you can have an 87.2% on an assignment, right? So when I press play now, I should be able to type three, and then I should be able to enter three grades, eight, 100, 80, and 57. Great, and the program ends. So now I know that my program loops the correct number of times and gets my inputs. Once I have those, now I can focus on all of these little statistics, right? I can focus on each sub problem separately. So again here, yes, we are getting each grade separately. Now we are going to work on each one. So let's, let's actually break it apart. Let's do between 80 and 90. In order to keep track of how many grades are between 80 and 90, I need something that keeps track of how many grades I've seen so far that are between 80 and 90. So before my loop, I'm going to make a variable between 80 and 90. And I'm going to start it off at 0 because in the beginning, before I get any grades, there are no grades that are between 80 and 90. Now I'm inside my loop. I'm going to check to see if the grade is between 80 and 90. And if is a, a flag there, right? I can use an if statement and say, if the grade is greater than 80 and the grade is less than 90. And every time I see a grade that is, between, that is greater than 80 and less than 90, I'm going to add one to this variable. And I'm going to use the shorthand version of it. So that's all I have to do in my loop. And then outside of my loop, all I have to do is print that variable. So prints the answer. So I can test this, right? I can say I have three grades. I have a, a 90, I have an 85, and I have a 100. And only one of those is between 80 and 90, you know, not including 80 or 90. So good, it, it produces the correct answer. So again, we had something before the loop that was keeping track of how many values are between 80 and 90. We had code inside the loop that is actually checking to see if that grade is between 80 and 90. And then we had something after the loop, which is where we print the answer. Now let's move on to the next problem, max value. For the max value, I need to keep track of, similar to before, what is the current max value. So I'm going to go ahead and say max value, uh, max grade is equal to, and I'm going to leave it blank for right now. Um, the program won't run, but I just want to show you why. So let's go in here and let's use some simple logic. Check to see if the grade is the new max grade. So I can do that pretty easily. I can say if the grade is greater than the current max grade, then my new max grade should be equal to that grade. So how do we ensure that 
what we want is whatever the user types is their first grade, let's say it's 100, I want that to be the new max grade. But if the user types at their first grade a 1, well, if the first grade is a 1, then that's the max grade. So max grade should be a really small number. That way, no matter what the user types for their grade, we will guarantee that we will make that the, the max grade. For all you know, someone got a 1% and everybody else got a 0%, right? So you don't know. And then after the loop, we're going to print max grade. So we can test this now. So if I do 3 with a 90, an 85, and a 100, it should print out first a 1, because that's one grade between 80 and 90, uh, and then a 100, right? And it does. So for max value, again, something before the loop, which is a value with a really small number initialized to so that we can do it. Um, and then in the loop, we check to see if it's the new max value. And then after the loop, we print the answer. And for average, we've done this before. Something before the loop, we need to keep track of the total, right? So the total will be equal to zero. Every time we get a grade, uh, add the grade to the total. And I can say uh, total equals total plus the grade. And then here, when I want to print the average, I can print out the total divided by the number of grades, right? So again, following that pattern of something before the loop, something inside the loop, and something after the loop. So you'll notice that I didn't try to write this program all at once. What I did was I broke down the problem into these three main phases, and then once I got to the part where I had to calculate statistics, I looked at each one separately. You'll notice that the code that, that determines between 80 and 90 has nothing to do with the max value or the average, so we don't t they don't touch each other. So you can write that code separately. And if you test early and often, you will make sure that these problems are something that, you know, they're not scary and you can just do them, it just takes a little bit of time. So that's all we're talking about in this video. Uh, thanks. Get to work on the labs. Let us know if you need help. Uh, you can do it. All right. Bye.